marking the end of its 69-year rule. But how could deeply rooted communist ideologies yield so easily? Yeltsin set off a decommunization campaign upon establishing the Russian Federation. Statues of Lenin were pulled down, Soviet books were burned, former Soviet government employees were laid off, and many Soviet-related objects were smashed or burned. But all this still didn't get to the essence of communism. The denazification movement after World War II was much more thorough from the public trials of Nazi war criminals to the cleansing of fascist ideology, the very word Nazi is now tied to a sense of shame. Even today, the hunt for former Nazis continues in order to bring them to justice. Unfortunately for Russia, where communist forces were still strong, the absence of a thorough purge of communism left room for them to make a comeback. In October 1993, only two years after the citizens of Moscow had taken to the streets to demand their independence and democracy, tens of thousands of Moscow citizens marched on the city square shouting the names of Lenin and Stalin and waving the former Soviet flags. The rally in 1993 was of communists asking for the reinstatement of the Soviet system. The presence of troops and police only intensified the confrontation. At the critical moment, the security services and military officials chose to support Yeltsin, who then dispatched military tanks to quiet down the crisis. Yet communist forces still remained and established the Russian Communist Party, which became the largest political party in the country until it was replaced by the current ruling party, Vladimir Putin's United Russia. In recent years, in some surveys, such as those conducted by Moscow's RBKTV from 2015 to 2016, many respondents about 60% have said that the Soviet Union should be reborn. In May 2017, many Russians commemorated the 100th anniversary of the Soviet Union's rise to power. The Soviet... It's uh, not even believable that somebody could be so stupid, that they could be so weak and so stupid. We look like we surrendered. Not one soldier was killed in 18 months. I spoke to Abdul. Abdul was the leader of the Taliban, still is. And I had a very strong conversation with him, and we didn't lose one soldier in 18 months. And then we, we flew. There was no reason to even go quickly. I would have said, take the people out, take the equipment out. When everything's gone, get some of the people from Afghanistan that helped us, the interpreters, etc. Not tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands. It's a small group. But get them. I mean, people are fleeing Afghanistan. Hundreds of thousands of people are coming out. Mm. They're coming into our country. We have no idea who they are. It's, uh... Do you think we... It's very sad day. Do you for, think in the next three years we have to go back into Afghanistan, we as a convention? I hope are, not, but I would have kept Bagram. Yeah. It was always my plan to keep Bagram. Not because of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They spent billions of dollars building it 20 years ago. Yeah, right. Has the longest, most powerful runway stick. It can handle anything. And it's right next to China. It's one hour away from where they build their nuclear weapons. And they, they lost... Bagram. See, the world doesn't know that part about it. I don't think people know that. I don't know if they know it or not. How can you lose Bagram? It's one hour away from where China does its nuclear weapons. Now, to add insult to injury, they have a parade displaying all of the equipment that they got from us. Think of it. Yeah. 70,000 trucks. And these are armor-plated, many of them, the most expensive. This is not like billion, you, know, you yeah. go down to your local dealer. <laughs> Uh, 700,000 machine guns, rifles, weapons, helicopters, helicopters, tanks, night goggles, out of the box, brand new, better than what we have, the new model, mm -hmm. the newest model. And here's the other part. China is now taking over Bagram. China is going to have Bagram. And they also have a lot of our...